we're going to have a look tonight at how some organizations in Perth and uh, another group from over east have been using uh, have been using data visualization to realize a lot of value for their business and improve business outcomes. But before we start looking at the, I guess, the ThoughtWorks cases, we're going to have a quick trip down memory lane, and then we're going to see more broadly how organizations are using visualization um, currently. So I guess t uh, a little tidbit of information, the pie chart was invented in about 1800 by a guy called William Playfair, and this was about the birth of graphical visualization of statistics. But what we're looking at here was about 50 years later, we're looking at London in the grip of a cholera e epidemic. Um, so 600 people died in this cholera epidemic. And at the time, the prevailing problem was that cholera was transmitted by a miasma or bad air. Um, but a guy called John Snow thought it would be a good idea to actually produce a visualization of where people died. Um, and so what he, what he did was uh, draw on top of a map of London uh, a, a black box for each of the deaths um, caused by cholera. And so we see a concentration of, of deaths in this area around Broad. Um, and the realization uh, came that there was an infected water pump on Broad Street. And he was able to demonstrate seven years before Louis Pasteur introduced the theory of germs that cholera was in fact a water uh, transmitted disease. He was able to convince the authorities to remove the handle of the pump. Um, and he left a, and, and, and subsequently convinced them to stop dumping raw sewage into the city's drinking water supply, um, which I think you'll all agree is a great thing and an amazing public health and hygiene legacy from a simple bit of data visualization. Um, interestingly, no one died in here, this building. I'm not sure if you can see, but the brewery. Um, so no one, no, one, no, one in the, no one in the brewery was drinking water from the tap. Again, another, another fact that jumps out when you see the data visually. So if we fast forward 150 years, and yes, now visualization can look a lot more futuristic. Um, and here is, uh, here is a GE visualization of gas turbines generating electricity around the world. GE use visualization very heavily in their marketing communications because they're, I guess, a technology company and that's, that's a brand that they want to project through their communications. Um, when we look at business decision making, um, we have uh, Procter and & Gamble and decision cockpits. So the, the, the idea of a decision cockpit is that, like the cockpit of a car or a plane, anyone who's trained to operate the machinery in the cockpit can step into the cockpit and start making business decisions. Uh, so the idea here in, within P&G is that managers can be mobile and move around within regions and across products and still see the same information presented visually, the same decisions in a cockpit. Outside of the private sector, we have international organizations, we have governments, we have NGOs, we have interested parties who are interested in data, um, newspapers and ratings agencies, um, and even visualizing.org, a, a, a dedicated NGO, um, creating data sets, releasing data sets, um, inviting communities to participate in data, data visualization challenges um, to communicate issues and to solve important problems. And I guess one of those that that Mark mentioned before was Health Hack, held just uh, this weekend in Melbourne, um, and this is the winning, this is the winning uh, entry in Health Hack, which is a visualize. It's called Gene Machine, and it's a visualization of the quality of genetics data for researchers. Um, not being a geneticist, I can't actually tell you how to read that, <laughs> um, but I'm assured that it's extremely useful um, for the, assessing the quality of genetics data. So we look at, so with all of these examples, I guess we've got strong drivers for visualizing data. And, uh, and I guess we can pull out some common themes. And those are that visualizing data makes it easy to understand. Uh, so it represents, a visualization represents a large and compl potentially complex set of data very efficiently. But it also makes use of our innate cognitive abilities to interpret spatial relationships and to, and to build a narrative or build a metaphor on top of something that's presented visually. Um, they are a shared view. So with a visualization, it may, although it may take some time to arrive at an appropriate visualization, once you have that picture and you don't need to spend, within a team environment, you don't need to spend time disagreeing what the picture is, all of your energy can be directed towards making that picture better. Um, they provide a holistic view as well. So a holistic view is, uh, is I guess, nothing gives the big picture like a big picture. And they also provide new insight. So if you set out to create a data visualization, you'll probably 
see the things you expected to see, but you'll also see a lot more things that you didn't necessarily expect to see. And these provide, these insights provide jumping off points for asking lots of interesting questions and coming to new insights. Um, so we'll, we'll see some examples of those as we go through the presentation. And uh, the first example comes from the independent market operator here in uh, Western Australia, and Ray Grasso will be talking you through that. So I'm just going to take a little bit of time now, like Dave mentioned, um, to go through some work that we've been doing together with the IMO um, here in Perth. And I guess to sort of set the scene, um, to describe a little bit of who the IMO are and what they're about. So the independent market operator, um, they're, they're, one of their roles is to, um, is to operate and develop the wholesale electricity market in the south, southwest corner of, of WA. So the, the wholesale electricity market is where generators and, and consumers of large amounts of wholesale electricity can basically trade energy. So you have people on both sides, counterparties on these deal tra deals trading energy. And the main kind of high level goals for the organization um, through this market is to facilitate competition, to try and encourage private sector investment and sort of secondarily to also support the development of, of, of um, renewable energy sources and sustainable technology. It's important to sort of highlight this because it really sort of frames the problem um, that, that, we, that we walked into when we, we first uh, sat down with the IMO earlier this year. And, and it also highlights a key idea that um, Alan, the CEO, and most of the organization kind of holds on to this idea that um, transparency can really be used to, to drive market efficiency. So transparency of data, access to data, um, visibility into that um, is something that is generally more useful in more people's hands. So it can then drive more activity in the market and therefore hopefully get a more efficient market. So that kind of sets the scene. And, and these are the kinds of questions that, that were or well, the problems, I guess, when, that were quoted when we sat down with the IMO earlier this year. Um, the IMO, um, as part of their role as, as a market operator, collect a, a, a wide array of data about the market. So you have sort of generation information, you know, pricing information, some of which they generate, uh, a, a broad set of, of information. And there are rules and regulations around what, they can, what is publicly consumable and what isn't. They were publishing a whole set of this data already through their existing website, through sort of flat files and sort of static reports and charts and things like that. But there was kind of an overriding sense that they could be doing more with this data and they could be doing more um, in, in getting it into people's hands in a more consumable way. And, and sort of a, attached to that is the idea that um, along with that, you know, along with getting the data into the participants' hands, so people who already interact with the market, there was the idea of getting the information into more people's hands just to understand what the IMO is. And, and the value of, of what they do, so the value of the market. So this space you can see is it's pretty broad, sort of high level, but, but there, there were concrete directions that they wanted to go in. Um, and, and really a lot of this is about sort of external communication. So we'll have other examples sort of subsequent about sort of internal operational type stuff, which I think is often a, um, kind of one of the, the initial places people tend to think of data visualization as being useful. But in this space, we're really talking about getting data and, and initially at least, and communicating it out for, with those high level goals in mind. So we'll talk a little bit now about how do you take these high level ideas um, and refine them down into solutions um, really quickly. And so we had those broad problems. The first, the first stage was really about deciding on a direction. And, and here we're really looking at who are, the, who are these different audiences? Who do we want to, whose data, whose hands do we want this data to land into? What are the kinds of things they're interested in? What are the kinds of things we're actually able to share with them? So again, this is a, a regula there's a, a regulation, um, regulatory environment around this data. There's also technical constraints. There's all these kinds of things which are very typical. Um, so within that landscape, what data can we get and where can we get it to people and how can we get it to people? So a lot of this stage is really sketching ideas, things like that. Um, we ran collaborative brainstorming sessions where we're pulling inspiration from sort of a broad a, a range of, of areas. So here we're looking at different ways of visualizing consumption. So of course in the IMO we're talking about consumption of electricity, but some of the examples up there are from completely different domains. And the idea here is really trying to craft that initial direction, that initial story, that initial sort of focus. 
And so once you move past that, that stage, then the next step is really about getting your hands on the data. And this is an obvious point, but it's an important point. And at this point here, really um, getting data in sort of the fastest, cheapest way possible is kind of important. You're not 100% sure if the data is, that you're looking at at this point is actually going to be what you're going to use. So just getting your hands on the data um, and so you can then start testing your assumptions is kind of more important. So there's a lot of like raw database access and, and CSV files and, and good stuff like that where you're just grabbing these, these files directly so you can start looking around inside the data. And really trying to understand if your assumptions hold up. So um, the kinds of tools we're using here are things like Excel, a little bit of Tableau, I, I guess really whatever kind of um, mediums that you're comfortable in to be able to work quickly to sort of almost prototype out some of these ideas. And, and it's really important just to reiterate, it's really important to do this because some of the best held assumptions around the data or where it's going to go or the degree with which it's going to illustrate something really can be challenged almost immediately as soon as you get your hands on the data. So some things, for instance, up there in the top left, we have a scatter plot of temperature versus load. And it pretty much followed the expectation. When it gets cold on the left, you can see the, temperature, the, the, power, gen, the power load is higher than when it's a nice middle of the road, 25 degrees in the middle. And then you can see once the temperature goes up above 30 and 40 that it rises up again and it's actually higher than in, in the colder temperatures. So that was what we expected to see and that's what we did see when we saw the data. There were other areas where we expected to see um, weekly cycles within some of the, the, price, the pricing in some of the markets. And that actually didn't pan out in the, in the exports that we saw. So there was kind of assumptions that we thought were there that were disproved and some that, that um, were actually proved. And the other key point here, I guess, is this stage is also about exploring so, and, and being open to unexpected opportunities. So really coming in here with closed questions kind of, kind of misses the point. So as you get into the data, other opportunities for, for further exploration can present themselves. An example of that was um, fuel trends over time. So fuel, fuel types over time. So we had trends of, of the different fuel types and their, and, and their use within the market. And we had that plotted out. And it told a story, but maybe not as... as um, explicit a story as, as we were hoping. But within that, there was, a, there was a thread around wind, the amount of wind generation and how that had changed over time. And seeing that, we really changed direction and then started to focus in on the wind story specifically. Um, and, and that's, again, an example of sort of letting the, you know, getting a little bit philosophical about it, letting the data lead you along type of thing. So, um, but it's a really important point. So at the end of this, the idea is you really want to have a, a, a product or an idea for a product and a data set that has sort of survived the sniff test. So you've, you've put it through the data. You can tell the data tells the story. And then the next phase of, of the process really then shifts into the, the sort of creation of that, of that communication. And it, and it does shift away from the data and shifts towards more of a communication problem. So we know the data tells a story. How do we now effectively tell that story to, uh, to the audience that we're, we're trying to target? And this is where, you know, getting, getting it in the hands of the audience making sure that you're testing with them, that they understand what you're saying, that, and, and getting the data actually in a reliable pipeline to your endpoint, things like that. So there's a lot of work sort of below the waterline as well as above where you're, you're rendering your, your presentation and you're constantly testing it. So uh, the kinds of approaches and technologies that we use that really help facilitate this, we use a lot, pretty much all open source technology. Um, we're we're web-based um, in, in their delivery mechanism so we can make our changes quickly and deploy those. Um, the ideas of, that we you typically kind of espouse, I guess, of continuous delivery, short development cycles, things like that are the kinds of things that can help you do this. Um, this is an area where the IMO did an amazing job as well. Like, when we initially came in with those first questions, I think within six weeks or so, seven weeks, we had some initial implementations of visualizations that we could launch with. And, you know, that a big part of that is, and a couple of guys sitting here, um, is, you know, was getting the data out and getting it out of the core systems and getting it in a form um, where it would be accessible out to the public uh, website and where we could build these, these sort of rich client-side visualizations on top of it. So it, when, when you kind of have that kind of collaboration and cooperation, you, you can really, you really can build some, some compelling visualizations in, in a really short amount of time. So to give you a bit more of a sense about what one of these visualizations might look like during this process, um, so we'll talk about the diversification 
So the, the trends over time of the power generation in, um, in the network. So up here is a pie chart that actually came from the, this was originally up on the site prior to this work, but it gives you a, just a breakdown amongst the, the different generators in the market, who's generating what, what their proportion is. And so, again, tying back to the overall ideas of, of the goals of the IMO, so demonstrating the value of the market, can we show that since the introduction of the market to today, that, that the market has actually shown, has generated more diversity in the generation market? That would be a good message. That would be a message showing, hey, this is the value of, of what we're doing. And so we got into the data. It made sense. It looked like it told the story that we wanted it to tell. And then it was about, again, rapidly refining that that view. Now this looks pretty ugly, right? Like it's, it's just a tree map, but I guess the main point here to draw away is there's a timeline across the top, and that's year on year. You can see there's a set of buttons up there. And with this visualization, what you could actually do was select any of these years, and the, the tree map down below, which is kind of just a different way of drawing a pie chart, basically, would update. So you could see, you could sort of interact with the data, and you could see, okay, it's sort of changing over time. And, and really, that, that timeline concept was really the, the kernel that, that, that sort of progressed through as we continued to build on this. So a fair while later, we had a view like this, where the timeline you can still see persists along the top, and it's sort of yearly, year based. But instead of that big bunch of squares down the bottom, we, we now had the different generators sort of drawn as these bubbles. So you had the large incumbent there, obviously still taking up the a large portion, but here you almost got the sense of the of the relative, almost the relative gravity of the different of the different participants in the market, and you could sort of see in a way that wasn't as obvious through like a pie chart or um, the the tree map, the the kind of the relative impact or the relative sizing of them. And so that thread really continued until after m many more iterations, we kind of got to this final view, which is what we launched with. You can see that timeline is still there across the top. It's actually now broken down at a month level, so we, working together with the team, we could actually get the aggregations at that monthly level, which showed you sort of more, more changes in this, in, this, in this story and gave you more of, a, uh, of an interactive feel. The bubbles are still there. It, both of these roughly represent generation, so you can effectively think of them as just sort of as one set of bubbles that talk about generation. There's a slight difference here, but the details probably aren't necessarily that important right now. And so there's a lot of polish between this and, and the previous two, but the, the key idea uh, of this progression, I guess, is that getting that idea and getting it in and refining it can, is, is, a, is a really effective way of, of driving towards the end result. We didn't have this in our heads when we first started that. This is where it ended up getting to. So let's have a look at that live. All right. Now. Here we are. So you can see this is, the timeline here is set to October of 2006. This is shortly after the market was introduced. You can see the, the large incumbent there with, on the left side, about 86% of the market share. And you can see a few of the other participants sort of floating around there. But really, the pit that really pulls this visualization together is, is the animation. So if I press play there, we'll see that time is starting to progress along the top. So we're going month by month. And as we're doing that, the, the, data, the data down the bottom is, is being updated and the visualization is updating with that. So we're seeing more participants enter the market. We're seeing the relative distribution change. And really, in a, in a pretty succinct way, telling a, a story about this market over the period of time. This tells that story of diversification. This arrangement of bubbles is, is is a, is a much better story than the, than the set of bubbles at the beginning. This is something that, that the IMO could then hand over to stakeholders and other interested parties and, and without having to get them across a lot of the technicalities of the actual complex data that's underneath this, could tell that story. And that is a key point. Like Guys like, like Mark did a lot of complex lifting underneath the covers here of getting this data together and aggregated up at the right level and stuff like that. So it's not just pretty pictures, there is all of that plumbing underneath the covers as well. But this was a really, this was a really compelling visualization of that. And so that was one of the areas where we sort of initially focused on within those first six weeks. Another one um, was really around wind and wind generation. So if you remember back um, 
around some of the, the, the goals of the organisation. One of their goals is around, you know, not only encouraging investment, private investment into the generation sector, but also encouraging investment in sustainable technology, so renewable energy sources and things like that. And like I mentioned, as we dug into the data of fuel types, we saw that actually there was a fair amount of, of wind, uh, the proportion of wind generation had actually increased. And that kind of opened up some other questions around, well, how much wind generation do we have in the southwest corner? Where is it? Um, coupled with the fact that Alan, the CEO, had been constantly badgered by <laughs> some external sus sort of sustainable energy groups about sort of highlighting this data and getting that story out, um, we shifted into this wind generation uh, visualisation which looks like this. So again, this is, this is powered by live data. So this is updated um, at the end of every trading interval. What you can see there are different turbines representing each of the different wind generating facilities uh, in the network. The speed that they're rotating in indicates how much they're currently generating. So the faster they're spinning, the more they're currently generating. The, the sort of size of the, or the radius of the turbines indicates their capacity. So you can see there, Colgar in the middle is the largest from a capacity perspective of the wind farms. And you can quickly sort of visually make a, an eyeball comparison between them. <coughs> Each of the wind farms have their own little sparkline graph off to the side, and all that shows is the last 24 hours of generation. It's just a qualitative thing. There's not you see there's no scales on that. It's just to give you a sense, sort of a high level view across this data set. And then on the top right, we kind of have the total wind generation. And there we have a scale just to give you a sense. So this is, again, talking back to, well, how much, how much of the power that we're generating is due to wind? And you can see there at about midnight um, last night, it peaked over the top of 200 megawatts. And so, again, this is a single visualization that is giving you like a holistic view across the wind generation data uh, and, and telling a story in, in, a really efficient, in a really efficient way. One of the points that Dave mentioned about you know, pulling together holistic views over, over information, that's, this is again, certainly within the communication space, one of the areas where visualization can be really effective. Um, and so a lot of the, a lot of the um, sustainable energy groups, for instance, were, were really excited when this came out. You know, this really highlighted the, 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 the win story in the market, and it, and it was something that was associated really favorably with the IMO and their brand. So it was a, it was a really good outcome. The next visualization um, within the IMO space, and the last one I'll, I'll walk through with you guys, um, really came as an extension of this work. So this was... This was opportunistic. This was work that, that came out after we looked at the wind, the wind generation story. So the next logical question was, well, what about the rest of it? Where's the rest of the power? So we'll have a look at that now. Hopefully, I'll just switch it into this mode really quickly. So there you can see where the capacity is in the network. So again, similar to what we saw with wind, but now that we're talking about everything, so this is all of the, of the capacity. And you can see where it's, where it's concentrated and where it's distributed across the state. The really subtle kind of change, you can also see what it's currently generating. So you, now you can see that was the capacity before, this is what's actually being output right now. Remember, this is live data as well. So again, you kind of have that qualitative view, you can have a look, you can quickly kind of get a sense of where things are. Um, what you can also do here is, is drill down and, and explore in a different way. And so here we have the current generators sort of grouped by the different participants. So these are the different um, companies that are in the generation market. And it's, it's showing them basically stacked by their current output. You can do things like hover over them to see where their locations of their facilities are on the map. So you've got the little lines coming out. You can get a sense of that's okay, that's where Alinta has locations. You can drill in and you can see their individual facilities. So this is Alinta's facilities over the last 24 hours in their generation. So you, and you can see what the, what the numbers are. So you can see that a lot of the themes here came from the, from the wind graph, but this is just showing it in a, in a sort of different view. And much like mentioned before, that you can follow the data to, to find inspiration, sometimes the visualizations themselves can also be extended in that way. So 
the main reason I, I, I wanted to highlight this particular piece of work was, was for that reason, was that it was something that was a reaction to previous work that we had done. And it's all up on the IMOS website. So if you want to um, explore, and there's, there's, a, there's a few others up there as well and, and other sort of data, data um, there's a data portal and things like that as well. So there's, there's a whole sort of rich array of stuff that's quickly been built up there. So it's actually really interesting stuff. Okay, so we'll switch back here. So we'll talk through some of the outcomes. So if, if you remember, initially, a lot of this was about getting the data they already had, getting it out into people's hands, building a communication piece, building awareness, almost building brand, um, and just encouraging people to interact. And so some of the things that, that came out of this, I mean, we had individuals asking if they could get their hands on the raw data so they could build their own visualization or apps. Um, we had analysts within the industry basically blowing the horn for, of uh, the IMO and comparing them to the East Coast counterparts, things like that. Uh, another area where I think the IMO were, 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 really, um, were really smart in their approach was, was getting a version of these visualizations in, in what was a presentation type mode. And they, they actually have it running across a bunch of the screens inside the office. And that then kind of led on to other sort of kind of more, sh like more broad sharing of information around the market to folks in the office. So for instance, if, if forecast data looked a bit unusual, you had general people around the office could actually see that. Whereas maybe before it was just sort of soloed in one or two in operational in op individuals in operations. Um, and even just looking like quickly eyeballing discrepancies and things like that. So there were kind of secondary benefits. They really weren't part of the initial goals at all. They kind of fell out afterwards. But that's kind of a salient point here. It's a bit of an exploration. I think you're getting a sense of that. So just before I um, finish up on this section, I guess just like to go through a couple of takeaways. Um, learnings that we've had, I guess, uh, general, general recommendations we would make if you were to sort of embark on this kind of, of work. I mean, the real data is key. Getting your hands on the real data is key. Minimizing speculation. Um, you'll, you'll no doubt in whatever organiza organization you're a part of, have people who know the data really well. It's still really, really important to get the real data and, and to validate that. Um, because even sometimes it can be as simple as it tells a story at a small sample size, but as you scale that sample size out, the story gets diluted, things like that. Um, the unexpected opportunities, again, is a theme that to, to really be aware of. It's okay to start vague and, and sort of be guided by, by the process to, to get to an outcome. But to really make that effective, testing with users, to, to, to basically check that you're communicating effectively is also really important. Without doing that, um, you, you, can, you, know, you can lose effectiveness with this as an approach. And finally, um, like I said, for those first set of visualizations, it was about six or seven continuous weeks. There was a little bit of a break in the middle there. We used open source technologies. So we basically have, we have database exports just serving up CSV files, really simple stuff. On the front end, we have a whole bunch of client-side JavaScript, D3 libraries, stuff like that, um, that are really driving most of the visualizations. Um, if anyone's interested in the technical stuff further, come and grab me afterwards. I'll chew your ear off about it. Um, and then finally, uh, just to make that final point, um, explore where the data leads and, and try and, and get feedback as often as you can. Looking at improving a call center, and this is a, this is a call center where there's a big improvement program of work going on, and the aims of the program of work are to improve customer satisfaction, uh, but also to balance that with operational costs, so also to try and reduce operational costs at the same time. So we're trying to make the call center better for customers and better for the, uh, the organization that runs it. The problem is the call center. Um, just how big is it? Well, I guess you can see the numbers there on the screen, 200,000 calls a day, and that actually goes up on public holidays and Christmas. Um, and, and all of these numbers combine to, to produce a data set, which is about 140 megabytes a day, 850 megabytes a week. So, if we, so the problem that we're facing when we're trying, setting out to improve this call center is it's so big, we don't have a clear picture of what it looks like now, let alone what we can do to improve it. Um, it's, uh, there are so many, uh, I guess that, that 500 products number is just an estimate because nobody actually knows how many products are being supported currently. That gives you a sense of, of how big this thing is. Understand how we might go about improving it. So to get a big picture view, 
we set out to draw a big picture. And this is the picture that we ended up drawing. So it might not, this might not be what you expected a call center to look like, but just bear with me and I'll talk you through it. So what we see is a slice in time. It's about mid-morning, um, about 10.30 in the morning. And there are around about 2,500 calls shown on the screen. Every call is one of the little characters on the screen. Um, calls that have just arrived, they've been classified into, into a certain type of call. They've just arrived and you're sitting, on, you're sitting in a queue on hold or in orange at the top of the screen. Um, by the time you're speaking to an agent, um, then they're in green further down the screen. And so the, the calls are classified into different types. Um, and the types are shown from left to right across the screen. So you can see that there's a lot of volume for some types of inquiries. There's not much for other types of inquiries. And then on top of that state where all of the calls um, are shown, we've got some transitions or calls that are transitioning state as well. We've got some explosions or some where customers are hanging up in frustration in the queue. Uh, I'm sure we've all experienced that. Um, we've also got calls that are, that are dropping down from uh, the queue into the, uh, into the speaking area. Um, and then we've got some diagonal lines which are showing calls being transferred from one, uh, from one type to another. Called about multiple things. Inquiry may be transferred to another call type to resolve that. Um, so this is what it looks like for a slice in time mid-morning. But it really comes alive uh, when we see it animated. So we're um, right now we're at about seven o'clock in the morning, uh, coming up to seven thirty in the morning, and uh, we're running it now two hundred and fifty six times real speed. So here's his data coming into the call, his calls coming into the call center. We can see people queuing, we can see them hanging up in frustration, we can see them talking to agents. Now, we expect to see when we, we set out to create the picture. What we see is that, well, we didn't, we didn't expect to see them in this form necessarily. We expected to see people going into a queue to talk about inquiring, to talk about a bill inquiry. But we didn't expect to see it in a form that suggested how frustrated they were when they hung up and they popped um, with frustration and left the queue. Um, we didn't expect them to sort of see a deluge of people flowing in um, to, to talk to agents. It looks like, you know, there's a, there's a never-ending storm of calls coming into the call centre. Um, we didn't expect to see people talking, I guess, for so long to agents. By the time they're at the bottom of the screen, they've been talking for two hours. Um, and, but, but, we, we, uh, but here we are, we, we see different types of calls across the screen as well. So. We did expect to see different types, and we're seeing report fault here. We're seeing people inquiring about moves here, um, and we're seeing sales inquiries over here. We're also seeing the transfers coming in and out of the sales inquiry queue there. Um, so they're coming in at the top, um, and they're coming out further down, going to different queue types. So there are a whole bunch of things that we expected to see, but not necessarily in the form that we ended up seeing them. Um, and that, that, that in itself led to, led to a new way of seeing the data. And, understanding, I guess, the, the sort of human side or the customer impact side in this case. Um, but then there were a bunch of things that we saw as well, new insights that we didn't expect to see um, when we set out to create the mechanics of the visualization. Um, one thing we didn't expect to see was no one at all, literally no one calling about iPhones. You know, that's, uh, that's pretty difficult to explain and it definitely warrants further investigation. What's not so hard to explain is why no one's calling about Blackberries. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there is someone? Oh, great. <laughs> we missed them. Um, we've got here something as well. We've got another, uh, an, another artifact here where we've got demand mismatch to supply. So there are lots of people calling about business inquiries, um, but there are no agents there to service them. You'll see that all they do is sit in a queue until they pop in frustration. So again, that's an area to uh, address by actually staffing agents who can handle those calls. But then even beyond that, we saw some things that were even more subtle and, and more unexpected. So one of them, it kind of takes a little while for it to sink in, but these queues aren't actually working as we would expect them to. So we would expect um, a call to come into a queue and then wait in the queue and then come out of the queue. And we'd expect it to, to be fair that the first person in is the first person out. Um, but what we're seeing is that to 
being answered. So you can see the green, I guess, I hope you can see the green calls falling through the orange calls. Um, and so this was, this turned out to be an issue with the data. It turned out to be an issue with the ETL process between the production systems. Because of course the queues were working properly in the world. Um, but somewhere in between, data set that was being used to make operational decisions in this program um, and the real world information was being, uh, th th that information was being lost and being misrepresented. Um, and so it wasn't until we actually visualized it in this form because none of the other indicators, the aggregated roll-ups, the dashboards, um, and none of those other indicators showed that this was happening in the data. But it was potentially, it was being used to make uh, major decisions in a major program of work. So it was very important to know that the data was correct. Another thing we saw, oh, and that's actually off the screen, I'm afraid. Um, so I might just have to wing this. Another, th another artifact we saw, and it might be easier to see over here, was I think you can just see some of these transfers, instead of going diagonally to a different type of queue, they're actually going straight up. They're going back into the same call type. Now we can explain a transfer in that we actually classified the call wrong to begin with, in which case the agent should be able to figure that out in very short order after picking up the call and transfer it to the right place. So that would be diagonal across to another call type. Um, it might also be the case if they had multiple inquiries. So once the agent is finished with the customer, they can transfer them to their new destination to handle their second inquiry. But what we don't expect to see is being transferred back into the same call type. I mean, the possibility is there that the customer gets stuck in an endless loop. Um, here they've called to report a fault. Um, it seems that they can't, that the agent can't actually resolve that inquiry and they get put back into the same queue for another agent to do the same thing. Maybe even the first agent to, uh, to pick up the call again. Um, yeah, and so what's actually happened here um, is that the calls are going to agents that they should, the, the call should never have been sent to these agents to deal with. But in the interest of less, um, we're, putting, we're sending calls to agents um, that should never have received them. So this is a learning for uh, improving customer experience. That agents have the right training for the calls they receive. So now, as you can see, we're kind of running down to the end of the day. It's about 11 o'clock at night. And again, the call volume's really dropped off. Um, and we're really just sort of winding down for another day in the call center. Um, and I could. I could watch this all day. I could rewind it to the start and watch it again, but I should probably get back on with the presentation. So, so I guess yeah. I guess in summary, we set out to see. We set out to get a view of a call center, but we saw a whole lot of things that we never expected to see at the start. And what was the what well, and what was the general approach we took? Well, much as in the uh, much as in the IMO case that Ray talked us through, the first step was actually getting the data. And so that's what the data looks like when it's in a 140 megabyte CSV file rather than visualized. And then we evolved, and I'm calling it a fuzzy visualization. So we, this, uh, this visualization wasn't meant to be necessarily precise, but it was meant to give an overall feeling. Um, and we evolved it through a number of steps, as you can see. We started with the idea that transfers should be so shown as connecting points on the outside of a circle so that the different call types would be points around the outside of a circle. Transfers would be lines across the middle. And here we had a sort of metaphor that it's a tangled ball of string. We're trying to unpick that ball of string and make it a clearer picture. Um, but as it evolved, um, we sort of, we wanted to represent more concepts and it became, it became less, I guess by the time you can see in the, in the uh, bottom left over here, it's kind of a bit hard to read. And then we realized that it would be better off as a scatter plot showing call type horizontally and call duration vertically. Um, and it was time to a new metaphor, and that metaphor was the matrix. This was showing us the wiring behind the board, and that we could uh, we could pick up glitches in the matrix if we looked at it closely enough. Uh, and that's and that's exactly what we were doing. So the fuzziness and this ambiguity left room for interpretation and left room for open-minded and almost playful doing this, seeing this. Um, and those were really important because they uncovered not just that I guess current management, but also things we didn't expect to see. And once they were uncovered, then we could decide what to do with them. And we obviously, the most interesting or the most relevant to the program to investigate in more detail. 
and then it's sort of almost switched investigative mode. So playtime was over, and now it's time to get really deep and analytical and critical, um, drill right down into the root cause of an issue and resolve it, and then and then repeat the process for the next most interesting issue. So these show some of the additional visualizations that were kind of in that more critical analytical mode that came out of the, the fuzzy visualization uh, to, to actually resolve the issues that were surfaced by that fuzzy visualization. So I guess I could summarize those takeaways. Um, that that fuzzy visualization, that high level big picture, helps you discover interesting questions. Um, and the visualization will give you insight not just on the operations, I guess, that you see, but also on the quality of the data that's, that, that your is on. Um, and it's also something that you can evolve very rapidly. Um, so those evolution slide, that took place over the course of two weeks. Um, so to summarize the project, this uh, call center visualization was undertaken as part of a major program to improve call center's operations and systems. The visualization took two weeks to build and it used processing software, which is an open source Java tool. Um, and, the, and the real benefits that were derived were accelerated learning within the program, which both reduced the duration of the program so that critical, um, critical release points could be achieved earlier, um, and as a result, reduced the cost of the program and also allowed those operational savings to be realized earlier. So that was, uh, that was it for the call, and I'll hand back to Ray. Okay, so we have one final um, story that, that's a bit shorter than the other two, but, but it's a good one. And it is, um, it's some work that some colleagues of ours have been doing just around the corner uh, fr from here with, um, with Nopsema. Um, so Nopsema, as you can see the name up there, um, is the National Offshore Petroleum Safety and Environmental Management Authority. So, what, what, does, what does that mean? What do they do? Um, their focus is really on the safety of, of workers uh, and the environment in the oil and gas industry. So, for example, they have a, a fleet of inspectors who go out to oil rigs um, and who basically meet with the operators of the oil rigs and do inspections to, to ensure that they're fulfilling their, their obligations, their regulatory obligations. So have they got the right safety equipment installed, for instance, has the right level of maintenance been done, that kind of thing. The domain is actually pretty complex. So there's, it's, it's, as you can imagine, quite a heavily regulated space. There are um, a lot of different um, business processes that hang off these different reg regulatory activities. Um, and the environmental portion of their responsibility is something that's actually only been recently added to their, to their portfolio in the last two years or so, I think. And so, as is typical in a lot of these kinds of systems and a lot of these kinds of, kinds of domains, um, the, the, this, the core business systems have sort of grown up over time. And you have this, these different bits of information that are sort of scattered throughout it. And you have different, you have different operational staff interacting with these different parts of the system. And you kind of have different screens and different views on, on these different elements. Uh, and so some of the work that was really focused around um, here initially was trying to sort of stitch up again in that same kind of idea of the high level view of the call center, a high level view of, of the work that was in progress that, 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 Nopsema, um, that Nopsema were responsible for. Now, the initial piece of work was actually the, the creation of something that's actually very visually simple. So you can look at this, and it just shows a breakdown between um, basically assessments that they have in progress and where the, where the action effectively lies. So does the action lie with Nopsema on the left, or does it lie with an operator on the right? And there's actually sort of, there's multiple drivers towards this. So, so one of the main drivers um, when, you, when you speak to, to, to some of the folks from Nopsema was there was actually a lot of pressure on, on them once they took on the environmental portfolio that it was in a state where there was actually a lot of work that needed to be done to get it up to the level where, where the rest of their op operations were. And they're actually getting a, a fair bit of heat about that. And this was a way for them to really be clear about seeing where was the work and in kind of communicating that story back out. And there was also sort of an internal operational benefit to it as well. 
Um, so someone like the CEO, for instance, ha can have this on his desktop and get a high level qualitative sense of, of where, where the work is. Now, this isn't animated, but th this is static, but this is live data, and this is something that sits within their internal um, uh, web platform. So the right person, any person with the right level of um, access can come to this page and get this sort of high level view. Now, a lot of the heavy lifting for this technically was actually, again, kind of below the waterline. It was actually getting all this data from these, from these disparate areas and stitching it together into this view. And so, I guess one of the points about Nopsema that I think this, this project work that's quite interesting is that it also, instead of having sort of the grand ideas of how do you, you know, how do you think about and try and solve problems in, in an enormous call center or how do you communicate these high level um, ideas and engagement type of brand type activities like in the IMO case, this is sort of much more incremental. So, you know, you have these operational systems. You can take these really small bets, these small initial changes to try and see if you can stitch some value out of your existing systems. It doesn't necessarily need to be a really broad set program of work initially. So once this work was done, it was really easy then once the data was, well, it was easier, I guess, or possible, I should say, um, to extend the data further. So this was sort of a subsequent piece of work that was on top of that. And then again, it's a, it's a, it's a stack chart, uh, and it's, it's back from live data, and it's something that anyone sort of operation can come to and look at. And what it actually shows is each column here is an individual in the organization, say an inspector or an assessor. And the, the other axis uh, running across is, is the number of, uh, basically their workload. What are the number of cases that they're on? And it's color coded based on what their role is in those cases. So one person could fulfill multiple roles in different, uh, in different uh, assessments, for instance. And so again, based off that, with this incremental change, you could get a sort of snapshot of where the work sort of lay in the organization. And you could immediately get a sense for hotspots or folks who are overcommitted or um, the mix between the roles amongst the workforce and things like that. And again, this was something that was, was always up to date because it was backed off the, the core systems, which they have to update through their regulatory um, responsibilities. And it provided kind of this operational view that they didn't, quite, they didn't have before. This kind of, again, this holistic view. And it pulled in different, different areas of the, of the organization together. And so I think the salient point for this one is, is really about the idea of, again, being able to start with something small and, and simple from an idea perspective, though the, the work underneath the covers may not necessarily be simple, and then using that as an extension point for further work. So you, th this theme kind of comes up again. You don't necessarily need to know where the destination is to, to, to still be able to do valuable work. And that's why these sort of shorter, smaller bets with rapid sort of um, processes behind them can be a really effective way of exploring the space. So the final visualization that we'll, we'll walk through um, in Nopsema, um, is was, was really the result of an experiment. So the idea of history is really important within the domain um, of, of, that Nopsema operates in. So if, if there's an incident related to a facility, for instance, um, it, it's really important to be able to, to go back and see what are all the events that have, that have happened over time. What have been the assessments? What have been the recommendations? What have been the actions? Things like that. And so again, kind of remembering that this is a system that's, that's kind of grown over time, this data was, was, was littered throughout and, and there, there really wasn't this sort of single view over the top. And so uh, one of our colleagues took, I think it was about a week or maybe two weeks actually, um, of time out to really just try and pull together, you know, a, a visualization that maybe tell, that would hopefully tell a better story of that and sort of tell a higher level story. And and this is what and this is what was produced ultimately. Now, this is a timeline in the middle, and time runs from bottom to top. This is a timeline related to an individual facility, and you can see hanging off that that timeline. Uh, is, is basically the story of the facility. So there's an investigation, an inspection, some enforcements have been, have been recommended, and then there's a, an assessment on, on the action on those. And you can see how that all hangs off this single view. And again, when this was created, th there wasn't even really a, a test audience in mind. This was more about trying to unlock all the data that was already there and presenting it in a different way. But the really interesting thing is once this was created, the, the audience kind of presented itself. So again, this was internally focused. This is sort of an operational space type, um, type portal. 
and you had folks like inspectors who, who came to this and had that one-stop shop. They could look, they could see, they could get a sense of what was happening. And the funny thing was it actually started dragging in other p people in other parts of the organization that typically weren't interacting with this stuff. So you had data analysts who were coming here and, and freedom of information folks. So whenever there's an incident, there's a trigger for all this freedom of information work. And, and they would come to this as a sort of one-stop shop to see, okay, so what's the story around this thing? What, where, where can I sort of go further? Rather than digging across multiple screens or in different applications um, as, as they would have done in the past. And you know, even, even to the point where they're starting to ask for, for different features so they can be able to filter for certain things and stuff like that. And so this really formed a, a almost an area where it pulled lots of different parts of their operations together and, and, presented, and presented them with a really um, concise and uh, an evocative kind of view. So you can see if there's lots of clusters of things, you can kind of get a sense for, well, what's been the trends around this? Things like that. So again, that was, that was a quick one, but I think it's an interesting one because it, it does show the chance that there, there can be opportunities to do this kind of stuff in, in whatever business you're a part of. Um, that don't necessarily have to be these, these sort of broad, have these broad goals up front. And the idea of getting some of these simple things in as a, a kind of a seam that you can then explore further from. And you can sort of always reassess your investment, right, to work out whether, okay, is this still making sense? Should we continue down this road or should we draw a line under that? So now I'll just uh, spend some time wrapping up. So. We've sort of spoken about some of the, the history of visualization, some of the uses of it. Um, we've sort of we've dived in a little bit deeper with some of uh, with some of our clients and and um, and some of the work we've been doing with them. Um, the, you know, some of the areas you can think about um, using visualizations where it's really effective around sort of pro providing these sort of high-level fuzzy views of complex systems. I mean, the fact that Dave can explain the operation of one of the largest call centers in the country to an audience in such a concise time, I think, can illustrate the kind of power of that. Uh, the, again, and sort of along these, these, these lines, there's always a chance to sort of pull out unexpected insights. And some of this stuff is even just in the data. So like, for instance, at IMO, I know um, just getting your hands on the data in itself is an activity in, in understanding, can you even get your hands on the data? You know, what are the rules around this? What, is, what does this actually mean? You know, and, and again, in a, in a space where there's sort of regulatory uh, responsibilities, it's, it's quite important to nut these things out. And again, using the IMO as an example, like being able to craft really engaging communication, stuff that's, that's kind of has more of an interactive, engaging vibe to it that's based off live data. The kind of thing you can build and then have sit there for, for a year telling the story continuously. Uh, and, and I guess, and finally, so, what would we recommend in this space? How do you go about doing this kind of thing? What, what are some sort of approaches you can take? Um, if you get the right team together, sort of starting with a small team and staying really lightweight is a really effective way of exploring this. Not being, not being too held down by having a really detailed view of where you're gonna be, kind of being a bit more relaxed about having a guiding vibe and then sort of following that through with these, these sort of refining and, and constant um, adaptation of, 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 your, of, your, of what you're building, of your solution. And we've kind of been harping on this about, about this fair bit, but real data is really important, using real, da real data throughout. So getting your hands on the data as quick as you can and using that throughout your entire process because um, you know, it's all about banishing those, exp you know, confirming or denying your assumptions and ensuring whatever you're presenting actually scales to the kind of data that you're seeing. So that was it um, of the presentation. I guess now's a good time if anyone has any questions to ask Dave or myself. Um, we might have someone running around with a microphone. Uh, Duncan's pulled the short straw. Um, so yeah, if anyone has any questions or comments or any experiences in their own space, that would be excellent to hear. I didn't quite understand what you meant by minimise speculation. Could you explain um, that again? Yeah, okay. So what, what, did, what did we, what I mean by uh, minimise speculation? So, um, so often there'll be theories of basically of what the data will show. So we, we expect the data to trend in this direction or we expect there to be this kind of mix or although there won't be any data in that space, these kind of, of vibes. And, 
and that's really, that's really important because you're often going to have people who are, who are close to the do domain that have a good intuition about what the domain will look like. But in our experience, you, have to, you really have to kind of put a cap on that, set a direction, and then actually get the data to confirm it. Yeah. So, um, no analysis paralysis, avoid analysis paralysis or uh, something like that? I think I, I, there's an element of that. I think it's, it's kind of choose a direction, but don't assume that what you, what, you're, what you think to be true is true until you kind of see it with your own two eyes, I guess is another way I would, I would maybe frame it. Oh, I guess, do yeah. it, devise an experiment and test it, maybe. Something yeah, like yeah, that. maybe, the, the, yeah. That, yeah. In, intuition is, is really important, but it can sometimes be misleading, and the yeah. data will tell you whether you've been misled. Um, yeah. Do you have any learnings about? Um, you know, whether you're doing post-processing or sort of real-time visualization about handling the volume of data or making sure that you, you don't become a burden yourself by visualizing. Mm, okay, yeah, I guess two, two questions. The, uh, the, uh, yeah, the data volume is, is interesting. Um, in this case, uh, you know, there was a real, it would have been really satisfying to be able to deliver the call center visualization with web-based technologies, but uh, just simply couldn't find a, a performant way for them to, to, to manage that amount of data. Um, and so what technically behind the scenes, what's happening in that processing visualization is that there's, um, well, I could even visualize it for you. <laughs> um, now we might be, we're actually two days past the end of the, uh, the, the uh, visualization there, so I might need to start it again. Um, So, so we've actually had to only render the calls that are active at any time. So there's 200,000 calls to render. Um, and I guess this bar shows uh, how many calls are in the future still to come, how many calls are currently being rendered on the screen, um, and, how many and, and eventually when the space, it will show how many calls there were in the past. So you can see that although we're dealing with um, 200,000 calls, at any time we only have to render. That's not a good place to stop. Um, about three and a half thousand calls. Um, so that's, that, that was one way of dealing with that performance issue for real-time data. Um, so, so there's performance on the, on the sort of the rendering, the front end. Um, on the back end of actually getting the data out of your, say, your core transactional systems, there's a lot of overlap here with sort of the data analytics space, things like that. So having, you know, ETL processes or, or offline queues where you're pumping data and then getting your, your data sources from there is the kind of traditional stuff. Um, again, where possible, keeping things as simple as possible is, you know, is, is, is generally the guiding, the guiding light, I guess. Um, if you, if you, your business case, your, or your, sorry, your visualization case, you know, needs a live visualization of, of, of sort of a high volume transactional piece of, of, of data, then, you know, getting a, a sort of bespoke data source for that, that maybe is outside of your cooperations, might be the right way to do it. Or, or maybe if the load isn't that high, you can actually pull it off your core transactional system. So there's a sort of pretty classic trade-off within that space of being able to offload stuff where it makes sense or pulling it from the core systems where it makes sense. And on the front end, then there's things like, um, like Dave's describing. So just you know, trying to aggregate at an appropriate level, um, both sort of within the data but also within the presentation um, is, is a really key idea. And actually, as, as you'll see with most of these, like there, there are practical limits to the, to the channel that you're delivering from. So the web is great. Um, from a reach perspective, from a shareability, all that kind of good stuff. Um, and if you're using, you know, the latest build of Google Chrome, then you're probably going to get the best performance. But as soon as you, you sort of degrade down to older browsers, you, you have to start scaling your presentation down to, to basically fit that. And that's just the reality of, of the medium. So, um, and that is definitely work that we had to do with, with um, certainly within the IMO space, we had to be very practical about how much we actually showed and how we showed it in a way that could actually perform. And you had a second question around how do you avoid becoming a burden, I think? Yeah, that was more, I guess, on the, the back end ah, sort of okay. level. Yes. Um, about, yeah. you know, if you've got that volume of data, do you, do you make a call where you say, okay, we'll sync from like a secondary source or we'll mm. work from a yep. secondary or replica source or do our own kind of aggregating like you mentioned or do we go straight from the live feed and, and how do you make that decision? Yeah. Well, I mean, I th again, I think it's that, that similar idea. D 
this is areas where you can profile load and things like that. So if, if, you, if you know it's going to be a costly operation on your, on your core transactional system and you don't want this, this sort of, if this visualization isn't core to your, to your business, as in your, your core business function, then, then you probably want to offload that to a secondary data store or something like that. Um, if it is, then you need to scale things so that it, that it actually handles that, right? I mean, that's kind of the, the choice effectively. Um, but I guess there are a lot of options and, and you don't necessarily need a, a sort of a big proprietary system, whether it's a ETL sort of, or sort of, sort of um, you know, data, an, data analytics type package. You can do some really simple stuff to get the data out into these secondary systems um, and, and still sort of reap, reap the benefits of that. I guess I'd, I'd interpreted that as how do you avoid the visualization effort becoming a burden, um, oh. or, or the effort becoming a burden on, on a on a piece of work that where maybe visualization is not the ultimate goal. Um, yeah, and, and, and I think the answer to that would be well, yeah, we keep it small. Um, we constantly assess whether it's adding value or not, um, and that way you you make small bets and you don't have to commit yourself to a big a big investment that will not pay off. We've got one over there. Well, just that that particular visualization, you've, you've actually deliberately kept it fuzzy. Yes. And, and I was just thinking about that. Um, because there's actually another phrase that the, another chapter she mentioned that, which is like paralysis through analysis. Mm. Um, in comparison to a fuzzy presentation versus like a precise presentation, is it a deliberate decision to keep it fuzzy so that people will actually stop nitpicking something to death? Versus actually trying to actually look at the broader trends, have you have you actually put your foot into it before when you actually try to jump too quickly to to a precise yeah a precise yeah and actu actually when I guess kind of developing what we'd actually show in terms of the visuals here, um, we sometimes went too far down that analytical track like we were we were mixing, I guess I guess it's much better if we just remove all those overlays, um, and just leave it as as leave it as fuzzy. So when you start to mix in the fuzzy and the analytical, um, you, you're trying to engage two different modes of thinking at the same time. Um, and so it is quite easy to get to take a fuzzy visualization and think, well, we could see this and we could overlay that and we could overlay that and you know we can present that data as well. Um, but it's it's I guess it's knowing what to leave out as much as what to leave in becomes yeah. a becomes a real key. So that so that you keep you, know, you keep in that sort of open-minded exploratory, I can't quite see the details, but I can start to think about, you know, uh, rationalizations of why that might be versus here I actually need the precise, I need a precise cause and effect um, that's backed up by um, experiments and, uh, and results. Um, so it depends on which mode you want people to be operating in, I guess. Within that, within that communication space, certainly, um, restraint is, is key. It's kind of, you have to really learn how to, to kill your darlings, as they say. Um, sometimes throwing too much out there is you know it's 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 really engaging for people who are really close to the data, but it actually makes the comprehension mm. of what you're showing much more difficult. So within that space, knowing when to when to pair back, sort of probably going a little bit too far, and then sort of ratcheting back the other direction, um, mm. is is something that that we did a lot. And, and it's a really hard thing to have a, sort of a canonical answer to, right? Like we would often have conversations about does this feel too much? Does that not feel too much? And and that's where really putting it in front of people is. Probably your your best mm. your best bet towards getting to towards a, a good solution. Yeah, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, in the three projects, uh, the slides mentioned that the duration was about two weeks. Mm. Um, how many people worked on the project? Were there any specialisations? Um, so it, de it depended. So um, our project actually was initially six weeks, roughly, maybe seven. And then there's been an ongoing program of, well, I call it a program of work. That's probably a bit, um, a bit highfalutin, really. But there's been a, a sort of continuing set of projects on that. Um, within that, there was, kind of, there was myself and one of my colleagues working with um, a set of folks from the IMO. So, you know, enough to probably get three, I mean, full time effectively, probably three of us. Um, with other supporting staff, sort of character, sort of supporting um, actors, I guess in the in the whole thing. So, and um, that was within that project. Within the Nops, within the Nopsema one, it's really um, sort of two two folks um, working um, within that space. Um, actually, Nate can probably speak to that. Is that that's right? Yeah. Sorry. yeah. Yeah. 
So any and so, and yeah, and I think in, in the case of the call centre, it was one person for two weeks. But as Nathan and Ray have highlighted, there was, a, I guess, a supporting ecosystem. So it's kind of hard to, to tease out exactly where a lot of the contributions came from. But I guess one, one lead or, or a couple of leads who are producing the code and producing the graphics. Yeah, um, exactly. Is um, I, I guess you, you t the the folks we're talking about in these projects specifically are pretty are generally pretty broad. So I guess nominally developers or project managers who happen to be <laughs> mathematician developers at the same time, um, developers who are kind of doing comfortable in that visual medium as well as sort of um, you know looking at, at, at sort of that analytical space. So we're, we're pretty fortunate that we were able to have have teams where we had folks that had were kind of comfortable playing in multiple multiple areas. So we didn't sort of tend to have this sort of very siloed you know, developer or, and tester role sort of necessarily, though there were kind of folks around that that provided that kind of support as well. Does uh, that give you a yeah. picture, yeah? Yeah, I think you need someone, you need the ability to operate in the space of uh, someone who's viewing the visualization, and then you need to operate in the space of actually creating that as well. Mm. Um, so sort of combining that uh, holistic thinking and then the very detailed thinking about if x equals one, what does that mean <laughs> on the screen? Yes. More? Um, I was wondering if you approached problems where you were trying to uh, diagnose potentially an issue with, through visualization versus um, situations where you were trying to just present information, like a water cooler, whether you thought about them differently, if you could sort of discuss the um, different approaches that you took and... Yeah, so I, I guess, yeah, there was some... This, yeah, the water cooler example would be the fuzzy high level type of um, visualization. But then that actually led into, into multiple, when, when issues were discovered that needed to be resolved, that led into multiple other, um, multiple other spin-off visualizations, I guess, which had a much more specific purpose, which was um, we need to understand the scope of this problem, or we need to understand how this particular problem manifests, rather than we need to create an overall view um, to find areas for investigation. Um, and the, in, in terms of drilling deeper into a problem, it's almost, it almost became testing by visualization. Um, you, you might sit down at the start of that process and you might say, this is what we expect the picture to look like before you even get into the data or the visualization activity. And then you say, all right, if we built the right visualization, does, does it actually show us this? Um, and then you, can, uh, then you can adjust that. You can adjust the data or the visualization until you, you see what you expected to see. Um, so in that case, you, st you still might find things that you, you didn't necessarily expect to see, but when you're operating in a sort of diagnostic mode, you want to sit down first and draw a picture of this is what it should look like, reason through this is what it should look like before uh, running a visualization. Yeah, I, I, just a second on that. I think the, the core approach is basically the same. So you know, that getting the ideas together, experimenting, getting your hands on the data, experimenting with it as lightly, with sort of light tools, lightweight tools as you can. Um, I think f in where where I've been in those spaces, kind of, it's the, the difference, I guess, is where you draw the finish line. Um, if you're really just trying to, to get to the bottom of a, of a specific question, where it's an operational one, or you're trying to diagnose an issue, whether it's data or whatever, you, you know, you don't have to worry about, you just need to get a presentation to a mode where it's easy enough to answer that question. When you're aiming at more sort of water cooler communication type um, problems, then it's a bit more difficult, because then that's where, again, depending on, on the context of where it is, where you may have to actually persist with it longer it's not just about answering a question, it tends to be a bit more broad, potentially.